Good morning. Is God good? He is all the time. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the opportunity that we have to praise you. And we ask, Lord, that you inhabit all that is done today and let it all be done to your glory and to the praise of your name. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, here we are again. We're still in the book of Genesis. For those who are new today, welcome. We hope that you uh, fill, out, fill out the visitor's card or the connect card and, and we'd, we'd love to hear and get to know you better. We are studying in the book of Genesis and we're continuing in our view of the life of Abraham. Abraham is a key, maybe, the most important man in the Old Testament. As everything God is going to do is going to be done through him and through his descendants. We're in Genesis 15 this week. A number of weeks ago, we were we in uh, Genesis 12, we looked at a few of the mistakes or the bad choices that Abraham made or and um, yet in that next chapter, we see that he returned to the place where God had met him. He returned to that place where God had proven faithful. And it was there that last week, Pastor Shea talked about the separation that was necessary. Abram had to separate from his nephew Lot, and in that, God put him in the place where he wanted him to be in the land that he was going to bring and give to his descendants. In chapter 14, Pastor Shea also talked about and, and looked at this idea or this, this experience where these, this coalition of kings, there were five kings in uh, what we know of as uh, the Middle East, uh, king in the area of Babylon, another one in the area of Persia or um, modern-day Iran. And this coalition of, of kings had been dominating the kings in the Levant or, or in, in what we call the Holy Land. And the kings in the Holy Land decided that they were going to stop paying tribute to uh, this coalition of kings. And they came up against them. They um, kind of, kind of, uh, they just, they just pretty much destroyed them and took everyone captive. And when Abraham heard about this, he raised up an army from within his own household. He went after this coalition of kings and destroyed them and was able to bring back his nephew Lot and all that was associated with. Uh, the city that he came from, the city of Sodom. And as I was looking at this, I was thinking about this in Genesis 14. I'm, I'm really struck by what I think is an amazing thing. Abram destroyed this coalition of kings and their armies, but they had been ruling the Middle East at that time. They were exacting tribute from all of the nations in that region, including Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities of the valley, as well as the nations in the land of Canaan. So it's a remarkable thing to think about this victory that Abram leads, where he raises up you know, 300 plus servants from his own household. He follows these guys some 500 miles north into um, what, is, what is now Syria, and he destroys them. He brings everything back. And yet, he didn't react the way most people would react following this. He could have, complained, he could have claimed to be 
the king of the world, if you will. He had destroyed the ruling coalition of kings in that part of the world, and yet this didn't even cross his mind. He was just happy to be able to rescue his nephew and to return their possessions, even though he had the right to claim everything. He had the right to even claim future tribute <clears throat> as being as being the new, the new leader, but that wasn't the case. That wasn't the heart of Abram. And we're gonna see that this is, a, this is an important character flaw. I mean, not a flaw, but a, a, an important character trait of Abram that we're gonna be looking at today as we go through chapter 15. <clears throat> he was simply happy to follow the leading of the Lord and to do and to live where the Lord led. Hebrews 11, 9, and 10 tells us, by faith, he lived as an alien in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, fellow heirs of the same promise, for he was looking for a city which has foundations whose architect and builder is God. I think most everyone today would think more highly of themselves following such a great victory, and yet Abram demonstrates this incredible degree of humility, not claiming anything for himself or as if he were anything or anyone. He is just there to serve and follow where God tells him to go and tells him what to do. So with that, let's pick up in the next chapter, Genesis 15, verse 1. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Do not fear, Abram. I am a shield for you. Your reward shall be very great. So after this rescue of his nephew and after this very strange character, Melchizedek, comes for just a brief two verses to bless him. It says that the word of the Lord came to Abram. This phrase, the word of the Lord, appears more than 240 times in the Old Testament, but this is the first time it appears in the Bible in this verse. Throughout the Old Testament, this phrase is used to indicate divine revelation from God to men. And we should remember that Jesus himself, one of his titles is the word which is highlighted in the book of John. The first three verses in the book of John say, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. So this isn't just a title for Jesus, but there are countless indirect references to him in this way, um, such as uh, even during the creation story. In the beginning of creation, John says that Jesus was there and that it was through him all things were made. We see this highlighted even in the third verse in the Bible where it says, God said, let there be light. The active word of God. So this opening phrase here in Genesis 15 is gonna have important relevance in all that follows. And we'll see again how Jesus is the basis or the substance of our faith, which becomes the central theme of this chapter. And it describes how Abram, later Abraham, becomes the father of the faithful. God comes to him in a vision. He declares himself to be Abram's shield or protector. And he tells him that his reward is going to be very great. God was confirming to Abram that it was he who had actually 
won the battle against the five kings. And even though Abram had taken spoils of war from those kings, God promised him even greater blessings in the future. Yet we'll see here that Abram doesn't really care too much about getting richer. He has, a, he has a, another concern. So in verses two and three, Abram said, O oh Lord God, what will you give me since I am childless and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus? Abram said, since you have given no offspring to me, this one in, who was born in my house is going to be my heir. Like I said, Abram wasn't that excited about getting richer and being blessed even more. His great disappointment was in not having an heir, in not having someone to pass on all the wealth and all of the achievements that God had given him when he dies. And he asked God, will all of this simply be inherited by my servant? At this time, Abram is about 80 years old. His wife, Sarah, has been barren. They've never been able to have children. So he's asking God, who's going to inherit? Who, who's going to be my descendants? On a side note, I think this is an important example for us in our prayers. Abram here was very candid with God about his concerns. And we see that God wasn't angry. He wasn't disappointed with this question, which was an honest question. In the New Testament, we're told that we've been made children, that we've been adopted as children or sons of God, and we're welcome into his presence where he waits with open and loving arms. And we should understand that we cannot offend him when we speak candidly to him about our concerns. Abram told God, look, you haven't given me any children. And I think we're invited to likewise be bold with our father as we approach him in prayer. We always should approach him in love and respect, not be flippant or proud in the way we approach him. But we see in this that we can be candid. When we don't understand what he's doing or allowing to happen, it's not going to offend him if, if you say that. So in verse 4, the Lord responds. He says, Then behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, This man will not be your heir, but one who will come forth from your own body. He shall be your heir. And he, that is God, took him outside and said, now look toward the heavens and count the stars if you're able to count them. And he said to him, so shall your descendants be. Then it says, he, that is Abram, believed in the Lord and he reckoned it to him as righteousness. So God had previously told Abram that his descendants would be impossible to count just like the grains of sand on the earth. And now in this passage, God shows him the starry night and says, your descendants are going to be likewise uncountable, just like the stars in the heavens. He says all of his descendants are going to come from his own body, making it clear that his heirs are not going to be someone from his own household like this servant, Eliezer. In verse 6, it says that Abram believed God and what he had just told him. The Hebrew word here for believed is aman, and this is a primitive root verb, and it's also from that root that we get the very familiar word amen, which we understand to mean so be it, or let it be so. 
The verb aman has a broader sense, though. It's much broader than just saying that he believed or, or to, be, be, um, to believe. It also means to be established, to be confirmed, or to be built up with a sense of paternal responsibility, like a parent who guides and builds up and confirms the establishment and the growth of their children. So when this word is used here in Genesis 15, 6, all of that is incorporated into what was going on in Abram's heart at that time. He didn't just hear and believe the words that God spoke to him, but he embraced the conviction and the ownership of its truth in his heart, even though God had given him no explanations or nothing further to explain how he was going to accomplish what he said or when. At that moment, Abram was completely convinced in his heart that God would do exactly what he said, even though he wasn't given any further explanation. There's no indication here that Abram said anything out loud, but this is a very momentous occasion when he was convinced in his heart of what God said, and the Lord recognized this and knew what had happened in his heart. And then it says that God, because of this conviction of Abram's, the Lord reckoned it as righteousness to him. This is a somewhat of an obsolete or, or growing obsolete English word but it's still being used in some translations in the Bible, even though its use today is um, not that, not that uh, common. The English word reckon speaks of an implied calculation or a mathematical reckoning or a balancing. In previous generations, someone might say, I reckon that such and such is the case, or according to my reckoning, everything adds up. Today, one might say, I figure that to be the case, or according to my calculations, it all adds up. However, the Hebrew word is a bit more complicated or nuanced than just that. It's a primitive root word, which has the above meaning, but it also includes a sense that's very much like weaving or braiding, where individual parts are weaved together into something greater than the parts. One translator of this passage commented on the use of this verb, saying that the translation takes two impersonal objects of the verb as being equal. Or in other words, the Lord considered Abram's belief to actually be righteousness, and he imputed that righteousness to Abram. So in a way, we can understand it because it it says that Abram believed in his heart what God told him in spite of the fact that there was no evidence to back it up. Because of that, God declared him to be righteous. This word righteous or righteousness in verse six can simply be treated as a position of right standing before God. I don't believe it can really be overstated how important this one verse is, Genesis 15, 6, as it's one of the most pivotal verses in the entire Bible, even though it's really easy to read and then just pass over without much further thought. In it, we find the seed from which God grows his entire plan of redemption which will not be based on the blood of innocent animals, but exclusively on the faith of people who believe in what God said and in what he did through Jesus Christ. We're talking about the critical importance of faith in the role of every person, every person who will be accepted by God as righteous. The New Testament book of Romans, which many consider to be the most definitive statement of Christian theological doctrine in the whole Bible, the fundamental thesis of that entire book is stated in the first chapter in verses 16 and 17, where Paul, Paul says, 
For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the righteous man shall live by faith. We can really look at the rest of the book of Romans as an extended commentary and application on this one statement, where Paul quotes from the words of God to the prophet Habakkuk in Habakkuk 2.4. Romans 4, in Romans 4, Paul quotes from this passage here in Genesis 15, making a very big deal of Abraham's faith and how it was the basis for the righteousness that God attributed to him. In Romans 4, first three verses, it says, What then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, has found? For if Abraham was justified by works, he he had something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Paul was an expert in the Old Testament, even before he became a Christian. And in Romans 4, he's demonstrating that Abraham's righteousness before God came came as a consequence of the faith that he had in God's ability to do what God had told him and not because he was somehow better or more righteous than anyone else in his time. In the days of Jesus and the apostles that followed, there was a notion within many of the rulers of Israel that the Jews were chosen by God because Abraham was more righteous than anyone else in his age and because he was the recipient of the covenant of circumcision. But Paul is going to go uh, on to point out the fallacy of such thinking since this righteousness that was attributed to him by God came as a direct consequence of his faith, and long before circumcision was given or even the law that was given later through Moses. Paul concludes in Romans 4 with this, verses 22 to 24, he says, therefore it was also credited to him as righteousness. Now not for his sake only was it written that it was credited to him, but it was for our sake also to whom it will be credited as those who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. So Paul emphasizes the critical importance that faith plays in the role of our salvation today. And the other New Testament writers do this too. Genesis 15, 6 is quoted three times, or I should say in in three different New Testament books in Romans, Galatians, and the book of James. So it should be important for us to grasp the significance of what's happening here in Genesis 15 and how Abraham became the spiritual father of all who would later come to God by faith. We also need to understand where our faith comes from and what it means to actually have faith that pleases God. Paul said the following later in Romans. In Romans 10, 17, he said, so faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. And then in the second half of Romans 12, 3, he says, as God has allowed, allotted to each a measure of faith. Many people misunderstand what it means to have faith. But Paul makes it clear that faith comes from hearing and believing God, and that ability to believe also comes from him. Abraham became the the father of the faithful because he heard the word of God, and he was completely convinced in his heart that God was able to do what he had said, even without evidence or explanation provided. There are many people today who have this notion that it means what of what it means to have faith where some have been incorrectly taught things that actually distort what the bible says 
There are many who think that faith is something that we can generate within us and that we can make anything happen if our faith is just built up strong enough. That teaching has caused a lot of harm and actually there have been many who have fallen away from the faith when the things that they prayed for didn't happen. From a proper perspective on faith or for a proper perspective on faith that pleases God, I want to point out the story that's told in Luke 7 where there's this Roman centurion in the city of Capernaum who asked Jesus to heal his servant who was sick and dying. And when Jesus started heading towards the man's house and the and the centurion found out about it, he sent word back by some of his friends telling Jesus that he didn't even need to physically come. And and that's where we'll pick up the story in Luke 7, verses 6 to 9. Now Jesus started on his way with them, and when he was not far from the house, the centurion sent friends saying to him, Lord, do not trouble yourself further, for I am not worthy for you to come under my roof. For this reason, I did not even consider myself worthy to come to you, but just say the word and my servant will be healed. For I also am a man placed under authority with soldiers under me. I say to this one, go, and he goes. To another, come, and he comes. To my slave, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he marveled at him and turned and said to the crowd that was following him, I say to you, not even in Israel have I found such great faith. This is extraordinary. This Gentile understood that it was Jesus who had the divine authority to heal and that it was only necessary for him to speak the word. And that would be enough for his servant to be healed. Remember, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. And that's exactly the situation here in this story. However, think about this centurion for a second. We know from the story that he was a very rich and powerful man who also exercised the full authority of Rome in Israel. He was a man of great power who commanded the respect and obedience of many, yet look how he communicated with Jesus. He didn't command or demand anything, as might be expected of one who was rich and powerful. He only sent a simple request asking that Jesus heal his servant. And then when he heard that Jesus was coming to his house, he sent some friends telling Jesus that he wasn't even worthy to have him come into his home. The centurion did nothing to build up his faith, but he understood where the power to heal existed, and he stated very simply, it was only necessary for Jesus to speak the word, and he knew that his servant would be healed. Jesus was the object of the centurion's faith, where he had the conviction that Jesus could heal by just saying the word, and he didn't have any preconceived expectations of what Jesus would do. He just understood that Jesus had the authority, and he was asking Jesus to speak that word. In the story in Daniel 3, the three Hebrew slaves were about to be thrown into the fiery furnace, and they simply said, that they knew that God was able to save them, but whether he did or not, they were not willing to bow to the king's statue. They simply trusted God no matter what happened. In this story here in Luke, we're told that Jesus marveled. In other translations, it says that he was amazed telling the people around him that he had not seen such great faith in all of Israel. It's an incredible thing to think that Jesus, who is God, was blown away by the simple faith of this centurion, which should cause us to examine it very closely for our own benefit. 
The writer of Hebrews tells us a definition of faith and tells us how vitally important it is in pleasing God. In Hebrews 11, first three verses, he's, he writes, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen for it, but for by it the men of old gained approval. By faith we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God so that what is seen was not made out of things which are visible. And then down in verse six it says, and without faith it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is the rewarder of those who seek him. So in all the things that we've been looking at here, whether it is Abram here in Genesis 15, the centurion in Luke 7, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in Daniel 3, as well as what we just read here in Hebrews 11, it's all demonstrating faith in action. This is exclusively based on believing God's ability to do what he says he will do. The centurion had complete confidence in Jesus' authority to heal, and yet he made no arrogant demands. He had no expectations placed upon Jesus. He simply made a humble request that Jesus would heal his servant. Think about this man. Jesus described him as having more faith than anyone else in Israel. He was exercising that faith that God gave him, believing that Jesus was able to do what he was asking simply by speaking the word. And his attitude was really one of absolute humility. He was in a position of great power and authority He was rich, and yet he approached Jesus in absolute humility. And I think we need to recognize the link here between his faith and his humility. We're told that everyone has been given a measure of faith, and then it becomes a question of where we place that faith. What's the object of our faith? It's not something that we can generate or build up within us. It's already been given. As a simple example, we demonstrate our faith in the integrity of the chair we're sitting on by putting our whole weight on it. So in the context of our faith in God, it's a question of who or what is the object of that faith. Jesus said it very plainly in John 6. In John 6, verse 28 and 29, therefore they, these are the um, people that he was talking with, therefore they said to him, what shall we do so that we may work the works of God? Jesus answered and said to them, this is the work of God, that you believe in him who he has sent. That's pretty simple, isn't it? When Jesus said this, it was not yet understood that God was looking for men and women who would place their faith in him and believe in Jesus. God's statement about this had been written more than 600 years earlier in Habakkuk, but the people didn't understand what God had said through the prophet. Just like this passage in Genesis 15, 6 was not understood. Habakkuk 2.4 says, and these are the words of God uh, to Habakkuk. He says, behold, as for the proud one, his soul is not right within him, but the righteous will live by his faith. God told Habakkuk that the righteous will live by his faith, and this becomes the basis of our Christian doctrine with the object of that faith being Jesus Christ whom God sent to the earth to save many. However, look at what the Lord said was in opposition 
to the righteousness that's realized by faith. He said that it was the proud whose souls were not right within them. And this is very important for us to understand and realize as we seek to have the same faith of Abraham or the faith of the centurion in Luke 7. It's an important link between effective faith and humility, which is the polar opposite of pride, as God said here in Habakkuk 2.4. I want to look for a minute at another passage where Jesus is teaching his disciples, and in Luke 17, his disciples come to him, and they have a request. They want Jesus to increase their faith. In verses 5 and 6, it says, The apostles said to the Lord, Increase our faith. And the Lord said, If you had the faith like a mustard seed, you would say to this mulberry tree, Be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it would obey. So here the apostles asked Jesus to increase their faith, and the Lord emphasizes for them how massively effective even the smallest amount of faith can be. And yet when you read this, this answer doesn't really seem to give them what they asked for when they asked that he increase their faith. However, the Lord continues by telling a story even though in many Bible translations there's a break between verses 6 and 7 as if it wasn't related. However, I believe it's integrally related to what the disciples had asked for and the Lord's response to that request. He tells this story beginning in verse 7. Which of you, having a slave, plowing or tending sheep, will say to him when he has come in from the field, come immediately and sit down to eat. But will he not say to him, make my dinner, prepare for me to eat and properly clothe yourself and serve me while I eat and drink. And then afterwards, you may eat and drink. He does not thank the slave because he did the things that were commanded, does he? So you too, when you do all things which are commanded you, say, we are unworthy slaves. We have done only that which we ought to have done. I believe the story that Jesus told is in direct response to this request that the disciples made. Jesus describes a household slave of that day who is expected to work all day in the field And then, at the end of the day, they're expected to come in and serve the master before they do anything for themselves, and to do so with an attitude of no expectations, no expectations of being recognized or thanked or rewarded, but rather to have this attitude that says, I'm just doing the job you've called me to do. This seems like a very harsh description of what it means to be a servant, but Jesus uses it to answer the apostles' request for increased faith. He's essentially telling them that those who serve with this degree of humility towards their master have the faith for whatever is being asked. Such a servant understands right up front that they have no resources or power in themselves. They understand that they have absolute dependence upon their master and everything they need to accomplish the master's bidding is going to be provided by the master. He provides everything and only expects them to do what he asks. It's this degree of humility It's in this degree of humility that God can accomplish great things because his disciple understands that he or she brings nothing to the table except humble love and obedience. We have nothing to contribute on our own. Everything 
comes from him. Anything we provide, whether it be our own resources, our own abilities, does nothing to help God. It only serves to detract from the glory that rightly belongs to him. Our prime example is Jesus himself. Jesus humbled himself more than any other so that he lived his life on earth in absolute dependence upon his Father. In John 5.30, Jesus said, I can do nothing on my own initiative. As I hear, I judge. And my judgment is just because I do not seek my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Paul wrote in Philippians 2 about the attitude that we're describing. He says, have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, being made in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. So we should see how important it is that we demonstrate faith that pleases God and incorporate this understanding of the link that we're talking about between an attitude and a heart of humility and how that contributes to our faith. Every person's ability to be accepted by God was made possible through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And all that God requires is that each personally believe that for themselves, just like Paul says in Ephesians 2.8. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that, not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. So the faith spoken of here requires every person to acknowledge their own guilt before God. But it's a sad fact that they, and, and, and the fact that they're not good enough in themselves to be accepted by him. They can only be accepted by him in the righteousness of Jesus. For many, for all, acknowledging this fact requires humility. And it requires a conquering of that pride that lives within every, within every person. Have you ever wondered why it's so important to people what others believe today? It's okay for people to believe almost anything today except the truth that is declared in the Bible. All religions are treated as being equal, except for Christianity. Anything and everything gets to be God, except Jesus. Why is it that some unbelievers get so angry when they talk about Christians in general, or when they find out that they're talking with a Christian? Why does it matter to unbelievers what you or I believe? The answer of that is tied into who they serve. Jesus called Satan the ruler of this world. Satan hates God. He hates everyone who belongs to God. He hates everyone who God loves. He never stops working to, to destroy all of God's creation in this world, and those who follow him have become soldiers in his war against God. The world hates everyone who believes in God because Satan hates God. So it shouldn't be a surprise to us when unbelievers hate us. Jesus said in John 15, 18 and 19, if the world hates you, you know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you're not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, because of this, the world hates you. So in all of this, we should recognize how critically important it is before God in what we believe. 
This was first demonstrated with Abram here in Genesis 15, and it was later embodied in the person and the work of Jesus Christ, who became the object of faith for all who are going to be accepted by God. The faith of Abram was truly amazing in that he had nothing but the promise of God, and yet he believed him before any of those promises became flesh and blood. Abram demonstrated his humility in the prior chapter, in chapter 14, and I really think that it's comparable to the humility that we saw in the centurion in Luke 7 and the unworthy servant that Jesus described in Luke 17. He was able to fully trust that God was able to do what he promised. This was the faith that God saw in Abram here in Genesis 15, 6, and he was rewarded by being declared right, having right standing with God. Abram becomes our example of faith that pleases God, and we need to recognize the dependent humility that makes such faith possible in each of us. So continuing in Genesis uh, Genesis 15, uh, beginning in verse 7. And he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess it. And he said, O Lord God, how may I know that I will possess it? So he said to him, Bring me a three-year-old heifer and a three-year-old female goat and a three-year-old ram and a turtle dove and a young pigeon. He brought all of these things to him and then cut them in two and laid each half opposite the other, but he did not cut the birds. The birds of prey came down upon the carcasses and Abram drove them away. When the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram and behold, terror and great darkness fell upon him. God said to Abram, Know for certain that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs, where they will be enslaved and oppressed for 400 years. But I will also judge the nation whom they will serve, and afterward they will come out with many possessions. As for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You will be buried at a good old age, and then in the fourth generation they will come back here for the iniquity of the Amorite is not yet complete. It came about when the sun had set and it was very dark and behold, there appeared a smoking oven and a flaming torch which passed between these pieces or the, or the um, carcasses of the animals. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram saying, to your descendants, I have given this land from the river of Egypt as far as the great river Euphrates the Kenite, the Kenizzite, the Kadmonite, the Hittite, the Perizzite, the Rephaim, the Amorite, the Canaanite, the Girgashite, and the Jebusite. So here God speaks to Abraham saying that his descendants will be uncountable, just like the stars of the sky. And Abraham responds by asking, Abraham believed him, we're already told that, but then he asks for a sign. He asks, how is this going to happen? Abram was not doubting what God had promised regarding his posterity, but he was asking God about, about the possession of the land. And God answers with instructions to bring and kill five animals and to split the carcasses of the livestock, but to leave the two birds whole. These dead animals were laid out by Abram on the ground, half of them on one side facing the other half of them. So the, the animals that had been split and then the, the two birds on each side. God tells Abram when he asks for a sign, he says, let's make a covenant or let's make a contract. Abram immediately understands what God is talking about and is telling him to prepare because it was a practice in those days for two parties to jointly pass between 
the split carcasses of an animal or carcass of an animal to formalize a contract between them. Jeremiah, the prophet, makes reference to this practice in the following passage from Jeremiah 34. He says, I will give the men who have transgressed my covenant, who have not fulfilled the words of the covenant, which they made before me, when they cut the calf in two and passed between its parts, the officials of Judah and the officials of Jerusalem, the court officers and the priests, and all the people of the land who passed between the parts of the calf. So this reference is to what is referred to as executing a covenant or, or um, in, in this uh, the story that we're reading in Genesis 15. This is a reference to that practice. So Abram lays out the animals like he was told and we see that he kept guard over the carcasses and chased away the birds of prey that would come down upon him. And in that, we see that Abram fully expected God to appear. He knew what was going to happen, although he didn't know how it was going to happen. And it says that Abram fell into a deep sleep and that God then confirms this covenant. This is what we call the Palestinian covenant, by the way, which is his confirmation of his promise of the land to belong to Abraham's descendants. Abraham in his dream sees a smoking oven and a burning torch pass between the split carcasses of the dead animals, signifying God's commitment to fulfill what he had promised. In the story of the Exodus, God is seen by all of the people as a blazing fire at night and as a smoking cloud in the daytime. And this gives us a similar picture of what Abram saw of God in his dream that night. In verse 18, it says, the Lord made a covenant with Abram. And that Hebrew word literally means to cut. It means that God cut a contract with him. However, this is what can be rightly described as a unilateral contract, meaning that the obligation to fulfill the promise was only upon one of the parties. Abram didn't pass between the dead animal carcasses because he had nothing to do to fulfill what God had promised. The entire responsibility was taken up by God and he said, I will do this. There's nothing you have to do. And so we know this covenant is in effect even today. As God's promise to give Israel the land has never been rescinded. The real estate in Israel has been highly disputed over centuries and even millennia. And it's certainly the case today as we speak but God's promise has never been rescinded and we should understand his promise can never fail. But he took upon himself the responsibility to fulfill it. So we can be confident that he will do so. Genesis 15 is a pivotal point in God's plan for all of mankind as it was always his intent to require faith in him as the basis for righteousness among people in the world. Before creation, he was planning to send his only son, Jesus, as a man to the earth so that he might accomplish the undoing of original sin. But God would still only accept those who believe in the sacrifice of Christ as being sufficient to save them. So in this, Abraham became the spiritual father of all who would later believe, even though they may not be his blood descendants. Also, God has given each person enough faith to actually believe that. So it really just comes down to a question of personal choice and 
the humility to believe in what he said and did or not. Where are you on that question? If you've already accepted Jesus by faith, then what about the rest of your life? Can you let him be in charge of your future and follow him wherever he wants to take you? Like we saw with Abram and his willingness to just be where God told him. Or if you've not accepted Christ, is today the day when you will give up and ask him to come into your heart and to save you. If we have any here who's been struggling with either of these questions, let's pray. For those who are having a hard time trusting God with your life and the future, you can pray something like this. Dear Father, I know that you're trustworthy, but I do not always trust you. But I choose to trust myself instead. Please forgive me for those times and help me to walk before you in absolute humility and faith, trusting what you're going to do in the rest of my life. Amen. For any who have never accepted Christ, you can pray something like this. Dear God, I am a sinner and I'm sorry for all that I've done against you. Please forgive me and come into my heart and live forever. Please lead me in the way that I should go and help me to live for you from now on. Amen. If you prayed either of these prayers, please let us know or one of our servants here. We'd like to join you in prayer and um, get to know you better. Please stand while we close in worship. The altar is open for anyone who wants to come down and pray.